While the holiday season often includes sharing food and tasty treats with others, again this year, it won't be so simple. In some ways, it's even harder this year with a new surge in the pandemic, rising inflation and the growing impacts of climate change, including on supply chains. How has it influenced our eating habits? Let's ask. In the provincial capital, food activist, chef and author, Joshna Maharaj, and Marian Chan, principal at Trendspotter Consulting, who works with food manufacturers to figure out the products consumers want. Welcome to you both. Hello. Thanks for having us. So, uh, confession, I was one of those people during the early days of the pandemic that was trying my uh, hand at cooking because I'm not the best cook. <laughs> And I was very happy when I made a nice loaf of bread um, that was edible, uh, so points for me. But um, a lot of things have happened in the past two years. Uh, Marianne, I wanted to start with you. How did the pandemic change our eating habits? Well, I mean, I, I think that the, the biggest change, I mean, you just touched it uh, on, right on the head, is that um, people are cooking more. I mean, people always cooked before, but it was always in a very haphazard manner. And so I think that the cooking that people are, are doing now is much more focused. Um, it's thoughtful. They're, they're putting some time and effort into figuring out what they want to cook and, um, and, and how to do it. Because for those who didn't cook before, they were learning to cook. And for those who cooked before, were being a bit more experimental and and preparing foods that were perhaps a little bit different and more involved than they otherwise would have. And the one thing I did notice too is that I think we're more av aware of where our food uh, is coming from. Joshna, how did the pandemic change um, our eating habits? Uh, I'm, I'm with Marion there. The fact that the, the home cooking piece has been huge. Uh, and I have to tell you, I like so naively in like in April or so of 2020, when the, when it was very clear that everybody was back in their kitchens and cooking, uh, I knowing that it takes, right. They say it takes 21 days to build a new habit. Mm -hmm. I was like, Oh, please, Oh, please let this thing last at least 21 days. So this new habit can stick. Uh, and, uh, I got my wish and then some, but it is, uh, it is definitely one of the gifts that has come from the pandemic and from us being forced back into our homes. But like you said, there's more happening here than just, uh, more whole meals being cooked. It's people connecting to what, what a meal time with others in their home on a regular basis actually means. It's, as you said, thinking about how that food is actually going to come in the door, where it's going to come from, how we're actually going to pull, you know, we're going to buy it and make these connections. And that, as somebody who is really trying to get people's attention about the nature of our food system, it is it has been amazing to watch. Uh, right. It has definitely been something, although a lot of what we've uncovered has been problematic. Mm -hmm. It has been wonderful to see this many eyes and this much attention on the issue. And that I'm really excited about. Uh, and one of the things that I saw more of uh, in the past two years, it was there before were those meal uh, planning kits. Right. So you don't have yeah. to if you don't go to the grocery store, if you're not a very uh, experimental cook, they have the recipes laid out for you and the food comes to your door. Uh, Marion, you know, you follow food trends. How do meal kits do during the pandemic? Mm -hmm. I think meal kits did e extremely well. I mean, they were already seeing some pretty good growth before the pandemic, but it was it was slow and I think it had slowed um, just before, but then it took off. And I think that it, it provided that impetus for people to start cooking, gave them a bit of instruction because those many some of those meal kits are very instructive. I mean, they they show you pictures, they give you step by step, they've measured everything out, and so it made that cooking process much easier, and it made it easier for people to prepare meals for their family, which perhaps they didn't do as often before. But I, I think that the interesting thing is what the pandemic did and where the meal kits come in is that it brought together a lot of things that were already on the fringes of, you know, work-life balance and how do I feed my family? And, and food is so central to to our lives that when we're forced to do something and we're forced to think about it, it becomes much more purposeful. And the, the kits gave them that push to, to do it a little bit more because I've heard people say, well, I got the recipe and I really enjoyed it and it actually wasn't that difficult. So I keep the recipe and I still make it without the kit. 
Um, I, I, I love the point that you made, uh, being more purposeful, because I think before uh, everybody's commuting and you just kind of have to feed people, <laughs> put food in the hole, right? Um, but right. Joshna, you know, one of the things about these milk kits that um, uh, sometimes I'm kind of like, ugh, is that they create a lot of waste. I think one time I got one and the onions were like in a pack and then in another pack. And I was like, why? But you're, yeah. uh, but you're a fan of milk kits. How come? Well, I am a fan of them, and I got one uh, as a as a gift, and I tried it out. And I also was really curious about the waste because everything was in its own plastic package. But when I poked around and I did some research, I found the, um, largely the argument being made on behalf of these companies is that the diversion from the grocery store and from that whole sort of network and channel, uh, this packaging is actually is actually a savings and is actually minimal in comparison. So that is interesting. I have yet to actually, I asked for an invitation to, to visit a facility and that has not yet happened. But this is an interesting argument and I'd be curious to pull, you know, to pull the thread on that. But I think that meal kits are wonderful training wheels for people who are nervous about uh, having success in the kitchen, uh, right? As Marion said, there are beautiful, the, 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 the effort that's gone into those teaching materials is quite substantial. And I think that they are a wonderful tool. And, and as we've heard people say, oh, I can do this. You know what I mean? If it just means the extra effort is that I buy the steak and I have to chop it up myself or I have to cut this onion myself, I can do that to pull this off. And if that is an effective way to to pull people, you know what I mean, in a safe way into the kitchen, uh, I'm all for it. I think it's a great way to do that. Um, I've made food with uh, with them with my kids, and my kids really love them. Um, yeah. So, you know, on top of everything else that we're having to navigate right now, we keep hearing um, about inflation, everything is going up. Uh, Marian, uh, milk and all dairy products will cost a lot more in 2022. Um, the Canadian Dairy Commission has recommend, recommended the largest increase in its history. How will inflation influence what we eat. Marianne? You know, uh, it, it's been very interesting. I mean, I think what the pandemic has really brought out is that huge divide between rich and poor or food insecure and food wealthy. And, uh, you know, for in the short term, for those who are in the food wealthy, you know, they spent so many, um, like almost two years, really not being able to spend any money, not being able to go on vacations, not being able to go to restaurants. So they're going to be less affected. They're going to they're going to complain and they're going to groan every time they go to the grocery store or, um, and it will be a topic of conversation. But for, for the most part, those who are food wealthy will not really care that much. The big problem is for those who are the food insecure, and we talk about this so much. I mean, I, I am a, a part of a Rotary Club and we spent a lot of our resources getting food for the food banks, getting essentials for shelters, getting some of those things that people need. And it's going to be a huge problem. But how people are changing the way they're eating is, you know, they've already started cutting back on expensive inputs like meat, um, uh, cheeses and those kinds of things. But it, so, so the inflation piece makes it even more necessary, becomes necessary as opposed to a personal choice of eating more pulses and legumes and, and things that are more plant-based. And so while it's not necessarily a choice that they might have made otherwise, it's kind of forcing them into that area of, of I'm going to eat less meat, one, because it's, it's uh, more expensive, but the other part is that it's probably better for better for me anyway. So it's kind of pushing people towards eating less, um, uh, less of those those more expensive items. And just to follow up on what Marion said, um, uh, Joshna, we know that food banks have uh, are experiencing so much demand. People who've mm -hmm. never used food banks are using them now. Um, but you have some top. You have some strategies on how we can cook uh, food or eat well inexpensively. What are those strategies? Yes, definitely. Uh, we know for sure that the most affordable way to eat is to cook food yourself at home. And so even if it is the simplest little sort of saute of vegetables uh, or things like that, uh, first of all, investing in cooking in your home is the one of the most important uh, ways to, uh, to address food insecurity and to build your own skills, right? Uh, a lot of people don't like 
don't really know how to cook that much. Uh, those skills aren't being passed down through families. So home cooking is really, really important. I also like to imagine that if you cook something uh, once, you can make enough for leftovers to be repurposed at another time. This Doing things like this also really helps you eliminate food waste uh, because so much of the food that gets wasted, unfortunately, uh, it happens in the home. There's a huge amount of food that gets wasted at the home level. So if you cook more economically, cooking more economically means planning things out a little bit, thinking about what your next sort of five meals will look like. And if you want to use sweet potatoes three times, cook them once, uh, have them prepped, ready to go, so that it's nice and easy in the few, in the next few days uh, for you to put those meals together, right? It's like this funny game that you play uh, with your present self, taking care of your future self, you know, uh, <laughs> in this sort of way. But this is, this is the most economical way to keep a kitchen running uh, and to feed as many people as possible. Marianne, you mentioned that people are eating less meat. Um, is there such a thing as a climate change diet? I, I don't think anybody would, would consider it a climate change diet. Well, I, I should back up and say yes. I mean, I think there are some uh, people who are on the on the front edge, edge or are a bit more um, radical who are saying, you know what, I'm cutting it all out, no animal products at all. And, and here comes the vegan. And so there are a lot of vegans who are, are vegans because of climate issues. They don't want, um, I shouldn't say all climate issues, sustainability issues, I think is more of the, uh, is more of the issue here, is because you know, people are saying, well, I wanna make sure that um, you know, animals aren't being harmed or, um, or the, you know, cows create too much, um, you know, environmental issues. And so there are those who are doing it for environmental reasons, but it's more about a sustainability, ethical, uh, ethical uh, raised animals, you know, organic vegetables. I mean, those are the kinds of things that are kind of on that leading edge. Um, but there's a lot of those in between people where you would say those are the flexitarians and they're the ones who are perhaps eating less, less meat or have cut it out, but if some if they go to somebody's house and they're served a piece of chicken or a steak and they, they're not gonna be rude and not eat it, but their choice is perhaps not to eat it. Mm. And, and Josh, now going back to that um, piece about how we're thinking about where our food is coming from, what we're eating, we've seen uh, the effects of the climate crisis in the past few months on top of the pandemic, on top of everything else in Ontario yes. here in uh, British Columbia. And I think people are trying to rethink their role um, in the climate crisis. So can somebody who eats meat also be an environmentalist? Yes. Definitely, and I think one of the in, one of the really important nuances of this conversation that we are not having is that is that there is an ethical way to eat meat. Not all meat consumption is the problem. The problem that we are addressing here is factory farmed industrial meat production, which is what is causing so much uh, unrest and directly contributing to climate change. But there, there is an ethical way to do this. There's a way that is fair to both the animals, to the land, to your wallet, to the community, to your health. There's a way to do this. And that is what we need to start paying attention to, right? It is, it is not, uh, because um, on the other side of things, there are a lot of plant-based food options that are not great that are not legitimate climate change solutions either, right? Some of some of the vegetable proteins and the and the and the, the all the different bits required to produce this food is really energy intensive. Uh, never mind the fact that they end up being really highly processed foods. So we have to think a bit more about this. We have to think deeper uh, to really talk about industrial food production, factory farms, and that sort of whole angle on meat eating and the cheapness of it all is really the problem that we need to address here. So yes, there are definitely ethical, sustainable, climate-friendly ways uh, to consume meat. Well, it's interesting you said that, the cheapness, because Marianne, there's a lot of people who um, are just trying to get food uh, on the table for their families. Right. It doesn't mean that they're bad people because they're eating uh, cheap meat, because we know if you want to eat organic meat, it's a lot more expensive than you know the mass farmed uh, food. Um, so how can eating right for the sake of the planet be cost effective? You know, people make people make choices, and I know lots of lots of people, and I've and I've heard of lots of people. When uh, if we kind of go back, maybe fifteen years, um, 
we were talking about organic vegetables. I mean, those were kind of the new things. And I was speaking at um, at, a, at a conference, and they had a, a specific company's conference. And so they had all of their executives on one side, and they had their plant workers on the other side. And a few of the plant workers actually put up their hand, and they said, I can't afford to feed myself organic vegetables, but I want to make sure that my children have the best opportunity um, and the best diet possible. So I have two fridges. I have one fridge for the food that my husband and I eat, and I have one fridge for all the food that my children eat. And in that refrigerator are all organic vegetables, all the things that I believe are the best possible foods for my for my children to eat and grow healthy on. Um, and then my husband and I will just eat the less expensive stuff. We eat more. And so those are choices that people are making. I mean, even in those situations, not everybody is in a position to be able to make that choice. But I think for some, where they can, they will make they will make some changes to their diet and make some choices that 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 fit with their budget wherever they can. Uh, that story is, you know, the sacrifices that people go for uh, to make for their uh, their families is just. Oh, um, Joshna, uh, we learned so much about supply chains during this pandemic. Two days ago, the Ontario government announced that they're investing $1 million annually to promote locally grown food. Um, they're encouraging Ontarians to buy fresh, locally grown and made agri-food uh, products. How far can this policy go into changing habits? It, it, can, it can go really far, depending on what local network we're talking about and what we're focusing on. Uh, I need to do a bit more research and reading myself about the area and the intention behind uh, this initiative. But really, the idea of eating locally has never meant more than it does right now. And so it's, it's encouraging to see this kind of thing, because originally our argument around local eating was about climate change uh, and about you know greenhouse gas emissions and this sort of thing. But now it's a matter of community community food security. Uh, right now, it's like uh, when things get thick, when disasters hit and there is, you know what I mean, you turn on the news and it is not a calm scenario out there. And so when if we have to think about the next time something like this might happen, hopefully it is much later than sooner, but what are the networks that exist on the ground, right? And the focus on local food now is, it, there's two reasons. One, it's about keeping communities together uh, and, and ensuring good food supplies for people because uh, what my pandemic experience really taught me is that our way out of this or the newer post-pandemic version of our food system has to be about a network of grassroots communities of people who care about each other. Right? This is the thing. This is how we are going to get through this. We can no longer imagine or depend on national distribution lines or, or that there's even a solution, one solution that works for this whole country. Right, we are a very diverse group of people here, and the the strength is going to come in us building the tighter weave right on the ground. And local food is a huge part of that. It's been really cool to see different communities with the urban gardens yes. um, come together to feed their communities. I'm Marian, uh, what is a positive thing that has happened to our diets as a result of everything that's been going around, including the pandemic, inflation, and the climate uh, crisis? I think that the the number one and Josh uh, touched on it is the is cooking at home. I mean, if you want to save money, that's the best way to make sure you can control what you're spending. Um, but the food is healthier. I mean, being able to um, to know exactly what goes into your food, um, how it's prepared, how much salt there is, how much sugar there is. I mean, there is so much more control of being able to cook at home. And I think that people are realizing that. I mean, when you ask, ask somebody who bakes, well, why do you go through the hassle of baking your own bread when you can walk out to the store and pay, you know, two or three dollars for a loaf of bread that's ready to go? And, and people, you know, inevitably, the number one reason is so that I know what is in my food. So I think that that is just just being able to say, I know that this dish has this, 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 and this. And for some people, it's like, and all of these ingredients are all local ingredients. And right. I think that that is uh, something that people are finding really um, a lot more important than they ever thought. Because it's not 
yes, it started as a climate change issue, but it's become uh, a point of supporting your community, supporting the local economy, supporting um, our country, whether it's, you know, right. you have, you know, meat from Alberta or you have vegetables from Nova Scotia or, you know, what, whatever you're, you're, you're buying, if you know that it comes from at least our country, um, you feel better about it. And again, if you can afford to make those choices, I think there's a lot more people making those choices today than they ever did before. Josh and I saw you nodding. Yes. Uh, definitely. Uh, this is exactly, uh, we we are seeing this uh, and understanding that not everybody, uh, as Marion said, is able to make this choice. But if you are, uh, these choices count, I think, more and more than they ever did before. So I cannot encourage this thinking. Uh, and yes, it is a little bit more effort. Yes, it is perhaps less convenient. But I think we are really getting a sense of what the, the comfort and convenience is costing us. Uh, right. This is this is part. This is sort of part of the issue here. Uh, and so uh, for paying attention to local eating and considering the community of people around you uh, is is got to be uh, close to everybody's top of list. Um, but how do we break that habit of like eating uh, food that's off season? I think a lot of us have been have become accustomed to eating. I don't know raspberries from California in the dead of winter. How do we change uh, that habit, Joshna? I think one is to really rethink what seasonal eating is all about. Because the way I see it and the way I like to tell people is like when it's strawberry season, I am all strawberries all the time, right? And it is indulgence and they are beautiful and gorgeous. And I eat my fill until they're gone and something else happens, right? And then and then it's stone fruits and then it's peaches and you know, and then it goes on and on like this. And so wait, enjoy the, the rhythm of the passing seasons, right? Those poor out of season raspberries are so sour and pitiful, uh, right? They don't, the, the melons, they hurt your mouth, the pineapples leave, you know, uh, don't do it, don't. And I just, when I see them, I'm like, I just want to apologize in the grocery store. I'm like, I'm so sorry, the journey you took to get here and you haven't even been able to be your fullest self. You know what I mean? It's, uh, it's a real sadness. Uh, so let the, let the melon have its moment to be the best version of itself and then move along to something else. Uh, if you're desperate for it, maybe think about a local frozen option because we've got lots of that here in Ontario, but really, really uh, think about the fact that seasonal eating is about wild indulgence until you move on to the next thing, right? So right now we're getting serious about our apples. That's our, that's our wild <laughs> indulgence right now. I'm laughing because I have strawberries in my fridge right now. <laughs> <laughs> Right? Aren't they so sad? They are. They are pretty the sad. Best of exactly. <laughs> Marianne, I want to there's ask you that also, same question. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's also um, you know efforts to have hot house grown. I mean, I was so happy last year, or or uh, time is is so fluid these days. Um, maybe it was longer than that when I was able to buy Ontario grown strawberries in December. And I thought, is this a freak of nature? Um, but they were delicious. I, and, and I caught them because I could smell them before I saw them. <laughs> um, and I think that that is um, something that is, uh, you know, being able to grow things locally in hothouse situations that are um, perhaps out of season. Um, but more to break the habit is, I mean, the supply chain issue and and products that are slower to come, I mean, I think that that's going to force people's hands. I mean, as a lot of the, um, you know, as Josh was saying, it takes 21 days to break a habit. So if uh, we're now in almost year two of completing year two, uh, I think the habits are being are being set, uh, set in stone. And we are going to be eating very differently for for the next foreseeable future. And as we think about it more, we may try, uh, but human nature is that if it's available and we can buy it, we will buy it. Mm. So the, the trick is to make it unavailable um, yeah. and we'll figure out a way to get over it. Marianne and Joshna, thank you so much for this. Um, I know that uh, the past few years have been really difficult and the lessons that we've had to learn have been challenging. But as you said, I think it's a lot to take on. Uh, maybe we can live differently moving forward. Uh, thank you again for your time. We really do appreciate your insights. You're Thanks so welcome. Thank you.
The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.